so today's topic, the Kardashev Scale, is a familiar one for channel regulars. We have talked about it before in passing a few times, but we have never actually focused down on it and discussed the implications of what it means, what sort of abilities civilizations with it would have, or what sort of flaws it has as a scale. This episode can also be viewed as a culmination or summary episode of a lot of the other episodes or as an introduction to them, as we have discussed a lot of the individual abilities of these kinds of civilizations before, so I am going to be referencing previous episodes a lot. If this is your first time to the channel, you might want more detail and can go to those episodes for them, and you probably also want to turn on the closed captions. We might as well start with the basics. Back in 1964, astronomer Nikolai Kardashev created a clever scale for identifying the size of civilizations. Unfortunately, it only has three official steps, planetary, solar, and galactic. This is kind of like having three sizes of drinks, where you've got large, extra large, and gigantic, and to make it worse, if the large size was a one liter cup, the extra large would be an Olympic swimming pool and the gigantic is the Earth's oceans. This is a bit of an awkward scale to use if you want to describe a tablespoon sized civilization or maybe a bathtub sized one. The other issue is that it goes strictly off available power, which isn't bad if you have to pick one thing to use, but is not really ideal either. After all, a modern computer can walk all over something like ENIAC from back in the days where vacuum tubes were state of the art technology, and a modern one uses much less power. Similarly, the post-stellar civilization we discussed in the Black Hole Farming video run on so little power they make a AA battery look like the Hoover Dam, and yet they would regard even the biggest civilization we will discuss today as tiny newcomers. Kardashev wanted a quick and simple system and it caught on, so we are kinda stuck with it now. I doubt he expected it to go into common usage or likely he would have scaled it better. I will link the English translation of the original 1964 paper transmission of information by extraterrestrial civilizations in the episode description, but it will put context on why it seems like I am being critical of the scale but not of Kardashev himself. The scale itself is a quick aside to give a general notion what we ought to be looking for when looking for alien civilizations. He does not even care about alone, which does not even make it onto the scale as a Type 1 civilization, let alone anything pre-technological. Now the three types he outlines, Types 1, 2, and 3, are defined by how much power they have access to. A Type 1 has access to an energy budget equal to a whole planet, a Type 2 a whole star, and a Type 3 a whole galaxy. Humanity would not yet be a Type 1, though a planet spawning super city like we discussed in the Yucca Monopolis' episode would be. A Type 2 would be a full-on Dyson Sphere or Dyson Swarm which we talked about in many episodes. But as a reminder, it is a collection of power collectors or artificial habitats around a star that absorb most of its light, though it is often portrayed as a big shell. Type 3 is not a galaxy-spanning civilization as most tend to think, where people inhabit most of the decent planets around most yellow stars in our galaxy. That might sound bigger than a Dyson Swarm, a Type 2, but in fact a Type 2 or K2 civilization, one with a Dyson Swarm, would flat out smash such a galactic empire. An actual Type 3 or K3 civilization is not one where most of the planets around most of the yellow suns have been colonized. It is one where every single star has been turned into a Dyson Swarm. Lots of folks have proposed minor alterations to the Kardashev scale, or whole new scales, but I think Carl Sagan had the best modification that keeps it as basically the same scale, but a bit more useful. He just tweaked it to follow a better order of magnitude scale, nice even tens. So in Sagan's, a civilization with access to about a megawatt of power, or 10 to the 6 watts, is a Type 0. A Type 1 would be 10 to the 16th watts, a bit less than Earth gets, a Type 2 would be 10 to the 26 watts, which is pretty close to our Sun's output, and a Type 3 would be 10 to the 36 watts, a bit less than the Milky Way's output. This is a lot better because it means you can just take the exponent of 10 to the whatever, subtract 6 and divide by 10 and have a nice smooth scale. It's not quite as smooth and intuitive as I'd before, but it holds the basic Kardashev scale and is a lot easier to work with in between states. In the Sagan modified version, a classic Kardashev 1 would actually be a 1.1, 1 
but a K2 and a K3 would remain a K2.0 and 3.0, and now we can scale smoothly to any size, so I will use that for the rest of the episode. I should also note that while planets and galaxies vary in size quite a lot, stars vary even more hugely, from ones that are millions of times more powerful than our star, to ones less than 10,000th as powerful. That is ten whole orders of magnitude, an entire level on our scale. And possibly excluding the very brightest and short-lived stars, you would want to build a Dyson Swarm around any star. It's not like planets, where those you might terraform to be Earth-like would all be within an order of magnitude or so, and even galaxies do not vary that much in size. Now as I mentioned, energy access does not necessarily tell you about the technology or population of a civilization, but we also have to decide what we mean by energy access. Current world power consumption is about 12 terawatts, or about 10 to the 13th watts, which would match up on our Sagan modified Kardashev scale as a .7 civilization, we would be a Type .7 or K.7, but we use a lot more power than that in truth, arguably the whole planet, since our food crops use a lot of energy, way more than we do. Once you get past the K1 stage that sunlight energy for plants starts to be something you have to pay for, either by creating it in fusion reactors or building habitats in space exposed to sunlight. In that regard we would already qualify as a full-blown K1 civilization or close to it. Of course viewed that way, we have been pretty close to that for a long time. Alternatively, a K0 civilization ought to have about a megawatt of power which in more classic terms is 1300 horsepower, or in more human terms about 10,000 people power. I find that an appropriate number since the term civilization originally referred to living in cities, and those do not emerge until you start having thousands of people bonded together a bit more interdependently than even the loose associations of multiple tribes that hunter-gatherers often had. This is also when you can start having machines more complex than very simple ones that just amplify or focus human strength like the lever or wedge or axe. So I would say the dawn of history would be when we reached K0 status. The scale is inevitably arbitrary in many respects. After all, if I included all the energy used by a hunter-gatherer civilization, to include the sunlight used to grow the plants which produced the nuts and berries they gathered, and fed the animals they hunted, an individual person requires very nearly a gigawatt to survive while that same land and sunlight could support a hundred times as many people with fairly unsophisticated farming techniques. One would think that the latter civilizations ought to be much higher on that scale. Similarly, those of you who recall the Eucomonopolis or Machioska brain episodes would see how these would also presumably rank much higher than the usual K1 or K2 civilizations they would be compared to. These energy levels tell us nothing about technology. Again, the scale was meant for civilizations past where we are now. But higher states doesn't imply more technology, except insofar as you'd expect that to get to those higher places on the scale, you had to be around for quite a while with a very large population, meaning you have tons of researchers who have been working for a very long time. Of course technology might just come to a halt. We cannot assume we can always just discover new things. You do not need much more technology than we have now though to colonize the galaxy. We have discussed before how we basically only need fusion, and maybe not even that, to colonize the entire galaxy. So while we can at least say no one is getting themselves onto the classic Kardashev scale without roughly modern technology, we cannot assume any technology beyond that. With that in mind, we will be looking at scenarios where the only new tech of significance ever invented are just those we might call Near Horizon not necessarily guaranteed, but in that zone where most scientists would say, yes, that's quite likely, and few if any would say, no, that is probably impossible, or I would not even know where to start. And be it K1, K2, K3, or even higher, we figure they have not discovered one new big thing. None of us think that will be the case, but as we discuss some of the awesome things K2 and K3 civilizations can do, just using the technology we have now, or nearly do, just remember how much more majestic they would be with those. As we will see, they are pretty awe-inspiring without them too. Now even the modified Kardashev scale, which is way better at doing increments, is not that great at providing scale. In some ways it is easier to think of it as a population scale, 
and the Sagan modified one is pretty decent for that since you can just remove the decimal place and treat that as an order of magnitude. A 1.0 is 10 to the 10th or 10 billion people, a 2.0 is 10 to the 20th or 100 billion billion people, a 3.0 is 10 to the 30th or a million trillion trillion people, and the in-between increments will work pretty well too. As we have also discussed before, while dealing with people who are basically human in their biological needs, a megawatt of power is a pretty generous power budget per person, even when you need to supply the sunlight for your food too. It's not perfect, but it gives us a pretty decent zone that is about right. If we assume a classic K1 civilization, one with the full output of all the energy that hits their planet, you would probably wonder where one that had terraformed all the rocky planets and moons in the solar system would be. You might be disappointed that it was only at 1.1 or 1.2, it goes up in orders of magnitude after all. Something like the Federation from Star Trek might make it in as a 1.3, Isaac Asimov's Empire from the Foundation series of tens of millions of worlds would be a 1.7, and a galactic empire of billions of planets would just manage to make it in as a K2 civilization. A whole sprawling galactic empire just barely manages to match one lone Dyson Sphere in scale and power. Yet as we discussed many times on this channel, a star encompassing Dyson Sphere, the thing which defines a K2 civilization, is not super advanced technology that only some ancient high-tech civilization sprawling over thousands of solar systems might build. Quite to the contrary, you would probably have started construction before the first interstellar colony ships left on their long voyages. I imagine you would get better at building it as your technology improved, but you do not actually need to have that improvement. So what can a K2 do? We have talked about some of their abilities before. They can move their own star, albeit slowly, by means of the Shikata Thruster we discussed in Megastructures Episode 8, and which is an innate ability of any Dyson Sphere. It can flat out blow up any planet in the galaxy, as good as the Death Star from Star Wars, either by use of a giant laser beam or more likely laser propelled relativistic kill missiles RKMs, that we discussed in Episode 9. It can send those out one after another, destroying planet after planet, and can even arrange for them to hit all at the same time. It is a civilization that regards building a Death Star sized object as a minor expense. It is also not one that has any shortage of construction material, we talked about that a couple weeks ago in the Star Lifting episode. They also have no shortage of labor to use to construct stuff with, even if they haven't got the kind of super automation we discussed in the self-replicating machines episode. A K2 civilization would outnumber us by at least a billion to one. For every citizen we have on Earth, they have an entire Earth's worth of population. Even with no other major technology to their advantage, they simply would dwarf us like an elephant next to an ant. They would presumably have better tech too since where we have hundreds of thousands of researchers, they would have hundreds of trillions. I have mentioned before, in regard to the Fermi Paradox, that no civilization would bother hiding themselves since once they have sent out their first radio waves, the cat is out of the bag. I have also mentioned that interstellar empires do not need to wait till the world has discovered radio to detect them. This is why because while we employ thousands of professional astronomers, a K2 civilization could as easily employ trillions. Enough to employ more than one person to constantly watch every single star in the galaxy. And you could build telescopes much bigger, and also much cheaper, when you already have an industrial base in space. They could build a trillion telescopes, each of which made the Hubble telescope look like a toy each aimed at a solar system constantly and manned. This does not even include that they can send ships to all those places too. In the star lifting episode we saw that a civilization could pull thousands of Earth's worth of metal out of their own sun, but even one thousandth of an Earth's worth of building material would be enough to build an aircraft carrier mass spaceship 100 trillion times over again enough to send whole fleets to every single star in the galaxy without making a tiny pinprick in your available construction mass. And they can man every single one of those fleets with millions of crew members too. Not that you need to send giant armies out to invade other solar systems hundreds of light years away since you can breed your invasion force during the long trip. Colonizing the galaxy is obviously not a big problem for them, 
Whether they leapfrog from star to star or just settle everything directly from their home system doesn't much matter. They can get out and colonize the galaxy and turn every single star into another Dyson Sphere. This is where fiction just breaks down. Authors rarely seem to try to tackle a K2 civilization, let alone a K3. I'm not sure if the scale just blows their mind, it certainly blows mine, or if they think the audience just won't be able to get into a story that is set on that kind of scale. It is hard to write about a battle with one when it could dump a billion soldiers on a planet as an invasion force and regard that like sending in a single small squad of advanced troops. Or that, even if they were quite peaceful, they could have the equivalence to Arlington National Cemetery that could sprawl over entire planet-sized areas as labyrinthine necropolises. Of course a K2 might be a biologically immortal one, we talked about that option in the transhumanism video, but if it weren't, if they were just like us, then they'd have several billion people being born and dying every single second. I would not expect they would bury them all in the same place, or even to necessarily bury them at all, but using the typical 50 square foot burial plot you would fill up several thousand square miles in a second and have the entire North American continent as nothing but headstones in every direction inside an hour. You would be able to layer the entire planet with corpses every day, and a new one each day. Of course there's no reason you would bury everyone in the same place, and indeed I do not want to imply a K2 would be some unified civilization. The thing about a classic Dyson Swarm, say one made up of rotating habitats in the O'Neill Cylinder Range, which has about a sixth of the land area of Long Island in New York, is that you would need trillions of these things each home to around a million or more people, or less if it was a dedicated nature preserve or something. That's another ability of K2 civilizations, they could devote a tiny portion of their energy budget to nature preserve habitats and have thousands of planets worth of habitats just for critters. A K2 has over a billion times the living area we do, and you can make habitats on par with large islands or places like Yosemite National Park without needing any super strong materials, and you could make billions of those without them being even a percent of your space because you have trillions of these kinds of habitats. Yet in spite of that, when formed up as a Dyson Swarm, they would not be any nearer to each other than a few thousand miles or kilometers. Space is big, really big, and a Dyson Swarm is not a 2D flat shell, it can be tens of millions of kilometers thick. It is a foggy cloud, not a shell. Each of those habitats is basically its own nation state and if it is orbiting as part of a ring then it only has two permanent neighbors, one before and one after it in their orbit around the Sun. These are very self-sufficient constructs and it probably could not even be blockaded from the Sun's light since it likely would have a backup fusion reactor or something, and if it did they could have a billion years worth of fuel stored up on hand, and they can pretty much recycle everything else. Trying to besiege one might be a process of several million years if you are not willing to actually attack it, just embargo it. You can certainly blow up an O'Neill Cylinder, but trying to invade and occupy one would be a nightmare with essentially only two skinny openings to come through. So you have a setup that trends towards a lot of autonomy, since once built, especially if they do have fusion technology, they do not need new shipments of material or fusion fuel more often than on huge timelines and you are pretty much limited to telling anyone who feels like being isolationists to do as you tell them or you will kill them all. Which is not as good a negotiating position as it sounds like. You have got we will cut off your internet and we will blow up your habitat as your diplomatic arsenal. Presumably you would end up with at least a league of associated habitats who had at least a loose set of rules you had to follow to stay in that group. It could be a lot more unified than that too. But that is the caveat on the sheer scale of these civilizations, because there is no obvious means of compelling unified action short of outright blowing up habitats. Don't expect that to result in inaction though. We have never had a single unified planetary government and we still get a lot done, and that has been the case for countries with very autonomous subdivisions or very unified ones too. A billion colony ships launched by a tiny sliver of a K2, instead of hundreds of trillions, is still pretty effective at colonizing the galaxy. Any individual habitat ought to be quite capable of building an interstellar arc all on its own, or people from all over could crowdsource them too. 
but it is another good reminder of scale. You could have entire religions or political parties kicking out of K2, whose numbers dwarfed even our biggest modern ones, and they might get regarded as a tiny little cult. I was joking after I made the Megastructures video on Discworlds and Hoopworlds that they are indeed very impractical, but I fear someone would still build one. They are quite impractical, but you could crowdsource construction of something like that in a K2 civilization just off the tiny percent of the population who thought it was amusing enough to chip in the equivalent of 10 bucks to fund it. They could do the same for whole fleets of colonizing vessels. I keep coming back to scale on this because it is what always gets missed in contemplating it. I think the mind shudders back from the concept of a K2 civilization, something we might easily be in under a thousand years, because the scale is just so overwhelming. It is a civilization in which a band most people have never heard of could fill a planet with their audience and have them packed in as tightly as a mosh pit. It is one where the heat energy released by everyone watching a primetime TV show, if released on Earth, would incinerate every living creature on land. Going to war with such a civilization, even if they did not have a technological edge, would not be comparable to the United States fighting a small country like Malta. It would be like the entire NATO alliance picked a fight with a single kindergartner. There's no point trying to hide from such a thing, especially because a classic K2 civilization is not a real one anyway, since they had the means to engage in robust colonization of other solar systems long before they reached full K2 status. It does not matter what other technology you might have, once you have a basic Dyson Sphere partially built, even just a percent of a percent of one, you get access to all the energy you need for interstellar travel. We have talked about that before, even if you never get fusion and never get cool things like Kugelblitz black holes to drive your starships, you can shove even large ships up to relativistic speeds using nothing more than modern technology and a ton of power. Slamming trillions of watts of laser into the back of a spaceship is not the image of space travel we normally have, it is a very brute force technique, but it gets the job done. And as I pointed out in the interstellar colonization episode, you would also expect them to be settling all those frozen rocks and rogue planets that hang out between solar systems. Not to mention colonizing your own outer solar system, which we will have an episode on soon. So even as that Dyson Swarm is getting built ever more completely, slowly adding more and more objects to your swarm, your outer solar system is getting colonized too, your Oort Cloud and every frozen rock in it is being made someone's home, and all those stars nearby you are getting colonized also. And I mean all of them. There might be a marked preference for yellow suns with Earth-sized planets that have liquid water, but when you get to the point that most of your population was not even born on Earth, but in some rotating habitat, a nice ring of asteroids around some red dwarf looks quite appealing, or even a dead white dwarf or a gas giant that's out in the frozen void. This does not even consider that those people might not be much like us, they might be transhuman cyborgs or outright digital people who live on microchips and only care about how many watts of energy they can get their hands on, not what color the sun is. Though of course every star is basically white regardless that we tend to call them yellow or orange or red. So I would tend to think that by the time most folks completed their first Dyson Sphere they would actually be at 2.1 or 2.2. Even if 90% of the population lived back around their own sun, they could easily have several thousand solar systems settled inside a century of the first ships leaving. The nearest star might be four light years away, but space is three-dimensional and there are over a thousand solar systems within 50 light years of us. And if you sent a million colonists to each one, they would fill up quite fast. People can double in a single generation, more actually, and even more if you have life extension technology good enough that folks are still having children when they are also having great-great-grandchildren. People mostly like children, we are kind of wired up to do so, and in a post-scarcity setup they aren't a huge burden especially if you are some 400-year-old Methuselah who has centuries of knowledge, experience, and accomplishments behind you, and still have all the vigor and hormones of a 20 or 30-year-old. Colonists to new solar systems have no reason not to increase their numbers and quite likely jumped on a ship for a long voyage partially for the ability to do so with impunity, or even applause. 
so you could see Dyson Spheres getting underway around those even before we finished our own, while new systems are still being colonized further out, way back from Earth, and then they start getting underway. At the edge of new space you would probably always have a shell of a few hundred light years of newly colonized systems, at various degrees of expansion, around an iron core of Dyson Spheres. This would eventually absorb the entire galaxy into a genuine K3 civilization. The funny thing is that unless you have actually found some way to travel faster than light, or at least communicate faster than light, both of which are probably impossible, you never get a K3. I mentioned already in regard to K2 civilizations that the default setup, trillions of rotating habitats that seem packed together, but in reality have lower population density than Earth, would probably tilt toward a lot of autonomy and local sovereignty, but there at least you do have the option to have common authority of some sort since you can threaten to just blow up habitats that misbehave too much, and there is at least a minimal need to get along and make sure you have some basic rules for radio traffic and ships and habitats to move around. It is not much, but there is some minimal need for cooperation and some option to compel people to cooperate. Once you get into other solar systems there is just none. Yes, the original solar system and later the core systems near it will probably have a strong headlock on technology and science and new art and entertainment, but it would be very hard to prevent anyone from getting their hands on it considering it would only take one infiltrator with a decent laser beam to send that information onto the rebellious home system. So to be honest, I just don't think anyone would try to maintain an interstellar empire. I don't think you would see interstellar wars either. I can imagine hundreds of wars going on inside a K2, with armies and fleets that would make World War II look like a schoolyard brawl, though ironically even such conflicts might be considered minor squabbles inside an otherwise peaceful solar system. But interstellar ones, without fast and light travel, would almost have to be limited to squabbling over all those tiny icy rocks in between those solar systems which might best be regarded as rural villages of mighty metropolises. Space, again, is also three-dimensional, so you have not got a few neighbors to pick a fight with, you have dozens, and dozens who can attack you if you get too aggressive. Now I could see interstellar organizations, or relative loose confederations with agreed on trade rules and currency, that sort of thing, but not what we would think of as an interstellar empire maybe the occasional close union of a few hundred systems set against a backdrop of a few hundred billion colonized systems. So in that sense a K3 civilization, as a unified thing, is probably something that can never happen without some sort of workaround to the speed of light. As a caveat to this though, we need to remember there are quite a few places in the galaxy where stars are much closer together, and in those you could get some genuine interstellar empires. Similarly, from what you can do with star lifting and shikata thrusters, you could easily see fairly tightly packed artificially created pockets of red dwarf stars forming some sort of super Dyson. Or with fusion, no stars at all, just a massive cloud of habitats, packed in as tight as they can without cooking from their own waste heat, or collapsing in together under their collective gravity. You get these kind of swarms even if you have better sources of power than suns or fusion, like black holes or antimatter, because you want to be as close as you can to others for communications and the distances between objects in these swarms is already huge enough to satisfy privacy. The average distance between habitats is huge, and if that is not intuitive enough, the average distance between individual people, if we scattered them evenly, would be on an order of tens of miles or kilometers. So people are not spacing themselves out for more privacy, they've got it. They are doing it for waste heat and gravity. Closer together allows you to talk to people who are not in your habitat real time or with minimal light lag. Historically, empires have often managed to keep things welded together even when it took routine communications months to get from point A to point B and armies a year or more to travel. So if we were generous and assume a one light year radius could hold together, and we contemplated that as a place where we just packed habitats in as much as we could, without needing some new way to get rid of heat, that could actually be a few billion times more energetic than a classic Dyson Sphere, and that would be pretty close to a K3. I have no idea what to name something like that, and I don't feel like coining a term, so if anyone can come up with one, let me know in the comments.
Some giant sprawl of habitats numbering the billions of trillions, each running on their own fusion reactor in some giant light year wide cloud bathed in infrared waste heat, probably with quadrillions of ships flowing in to stop at each one every few thousand years to retank their fusion fuel from massive bunkers left over from using star lifting to cannibalize a thousand suns. Anyway, that's about the only scenario I can see, if the speed of light remains a barrier, for anything like a unified K3 civilization. And that could stomp all over a K2 the way a K2 could stomp all over us. Now there really is not anything a K3 can do that a K2 could not do anyway. They would probably have way better technology, but we already agreed not to use that as our standard. After all, the Kardashev scale is entirely power-based and a classic K3 would be a tiny little pipsqueak compared to a single Matrioska brain, which is a K2 or maybe a K2.1 at best. But there is a long way between a K2 and a K3, and any number of 2.1 or 2.2 or 2.3s could engage in all sorts of projects like moving or making stars. I joked about a K2 crowdsourcing the construction of a Discord or Hoop Ward earlier, these could probably get away with crowdsourcing an Alderson disc. Such a civilization can be moving and making stars, they could be crowdsourcing bizarre megastructures like an entire star with a shell around it in the shape of a face of a popular philosopher, or they could be taking an example like the Horsehead Nebula and sculpting one to look like their favorite musician when viewed from their area of the galaxy. You can do some pretty extreme stuff at that level, even if you are still running only on the sort of technology we can see ourselves developing in the next century or so. You can even start launching projects to go grab other galaxies that left to themselves would drift over the cosmological event horizon and drag them back. You can move galaxies as easily as stars, technology-wise anyway, obviously you have to scale things up a lot. Our own galaxy will stay locked to a handful nearby us even as the expansion of the universe drags other galaxies away but you can get out to probably at least several thousand nearby galaxies and convert large chunks of them into shikata thrusters powerful enough to shove their galaxy our way fast enough to beat that expansion out. Maybe a good deal more too, even if you had to expend fully half that galaxy's mass to get it back here and it would take a hundred billion years, that might be worth it. This brings up the notion of civilizations beyond a K3 something Kardashev deliberately avoided defining as he viewed it as rather pointless. Even a civilization that had swarmed out over an entire galactic supercluster still would not meet the definition of a K4 using our open-ended Sagan modified form. And even a civilization which somehow has access to the entire mass of the Universe and could convert it into energy could still only operate as a K5 civilization, one with 10 to the 56 watts of power to work with, for a few million years. Civilizations at that scale can only be contemplated if you definitely have access to either faster than light travel or there is a multiverse and you can access that. Or you've just learned to sneer at the laws of thermodynamics and genuinely do have the equivalent of a power strip that can run by plugging it into itself. I think we will wrap up on that note. As mentioned, we discuss a lot of these ideas more in other episodes, and we'll probably have even more episodes on some of these topics in the future. By now, you ought to have some feel for how immense these sorts of civilizations can be and why we could and will probably become one ourselves. This also wraps up closely with the Dyson Dilemma of the Fermi Paradox since it is contemplating what these sorts of civilizations can do, and how likely they are, that leads to the conclusion of the Dyson Dilemma that intelligent life must be exceedingly uncommon or we should see these everywhere by now. By the way, I would like to thank Martin Resny of Resonance for providing the musical accompaniment for this episode. If you would like to hear more of his work, or just hear it without me talking over it, he's on SoundCloud and there's a link in the episode description to his work. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to the channel for alerts when new episodes come out, and please like and share the episode with others. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great day.